Hi, and welcome to SpyCast. I'm your host, Dr Andrew Hammond, historian curator here at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. SpyCast's sole purpose is to educate our listeners about the past, present and future of intelligence and espionage. Every week, through engaging conversations, we explore some aspect of a vast ecosystem that looms beneath the surface of everyday life. We talk to spies, operators, mole hunters, defectors, analysts and authors to explore the stories and secrets, tradecraft and technology of the secret world. We are SpyCast. Now sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Today, I'm up at over 100,000 felonies. If you were to look at what I was able to do and the number of users I was able to compromise, from my perspective, it's the coolest job in the entire world. This week's guest is professional hacker Eric Escobar. Eric has legally compromised, well, almost everything, from healthcare and banking to technology and critical infrastructure through to amusement parks and next-generation military aircraft. Listen in for part two next week. In part one, we touch on what keeps Eric up at night, thinking like a professional hacker, hardening your attack surface, i.e. protecting yourself and your information, and plain English explanations of important cyber concepts like kill chains and zero days. Hint, They're not not the names of heavy metal bands. If you're a fan of the podcast, I would greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a kind review on Apple Podcasts. Make sure to check out this week's show notes for resources to learn more. Thanks for listening and enjoy this week's episode. I was just wondering, just to start off, Eric, so you're a professional uh, hacker. You attempt to compromise all different types of networks from from the military through to amusement parks. I guess one of the first questions that I had just when I was thinking about this interview, you've seen quite a lot. Is there anything that keeps you up at night? Is there anything in the wee small hours where you're like, that one really like scares me? You know, the one the ones that really keep me up at night are are anything to do with critical infrastructure, um, which is, you know, obviously colonial pipeline and and all the havoc that that caused. Those are the ones that really just keep me up at night for a couple of reasons. I mean, really, uh, if you look at any of our traditional, uh, you know, different Internet uses, Amazon, you know, Google, Apple, like all these different services, what's the worst that's going to happen? You might lose some files, uh, you know, you might need to recover from a backup. Um, you know, your information might get out there, but with all the critical infrastructure, there's chance and potential for loss of life, which is way worse than anything that can happen in the cyber realm. So those are the ones like, like, uh, watching any critical infrastructure get compromised is really the thing that keeps me up at night because, uh, you know, lives are in the balance, lives are on the line. And we, we do a lot of testing for critical infrastructure and I've seen computers and machines that have been online and not been taken offline, uh, longer than I've been alive. Um, So when you think about how often you have to reboot your machine and it's like, well, these haven't been rebooted in my lifetime. Um, So it's it's really interesting to see those types of things because, um, you know, they interact with really big, expensive hardware. And so um, uh, there's a catch 22 that that happens where you you can't really take the machine offline to do maintenance on it because it's critical infrastructure. So then how do you test it to make sure that a hacker can't take it offline or maintenance can't be done on it? Right. So um, to answer your question, critical infrastructure is what really keeps me up at night because of the actual physical um, harm that it could do in the world. Wow. And before we uh, met today, I mentioned that some of our listeners are involved in this business. Some of them are involved in the intelligence business and some of them are just people on the street that love a good spy story or that are trying to get up to date with what's happening in the world. So just to give them a better understanding of what we're talking about here at the Spy Museum, we have a shard from the Aurora Generator test in 2007, which basically is a, a test to prove that a piece of code can affect the physical world. And basically, to cut a long story short, they blew up a generator 
So something that's intangible can affect the tangible world. So that's ultimately what you're talking about. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that's that's my actual job is doing exactly that. Um, not like not too dissimilar. A couple of weeks ago, we compromised up uh, um, what's it called an oil refinery. So that same exact like, hey, we're able to access um, you know industrial control systems, and if we touch the wrong computer, if we do something wrong, things go boom. Um, and so that that's why it's my fear because that, uh, exactly that that code can affect the real world in those uh, you know in those circumstances. Okay. Wow. And how did you get into this business, Eric? How did you end up? Because your background, uh, actually, like uh, our intern at the moment's father, uh, who's a civil engineer, your background's in civil engineering. So tell us a little bit more about that transition. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when I was in in high school, I was like, man, I want to do some engineering. I'm good with math, good with science. Um, So I did like the survey of all the different types of engineers that there were. There's like a class that my high school offered. Um, and so it was either computer engineering or it was civil engineering. I was like, you know what? I don't want to be behind a desk all day on a computer. So I'm going to go into civil engineering and build real things out in the real world. So I go to school, get a master's degree in civil engineering, get my, uh, you know, I'm a registered civil engineer still in the state of California, uh, you know, in the United States. And I started working for a couple of years and they kept sending me out to these very remote places. And I was like, Hey, I'm getting married. I'm going to have wife and kids here soon. I can't be like out on all these you know remote places doing random work out in the field. Um, and so then, uh, as luck would have it, my college roommate, his dad was a uh, um, you know head of security for a large company in Silicon Valley. And he goes, you know what? You got the mind for this. You want to like I'll replace your engineering salary if you just want to give this a go. And so I looked at you know I talked talked it over with my soon to be wife, and I was just like, so how are we feeling about this? And she's like, oh, I mean. Uh, no time like the present. So I made the hop from civil engineering into the security industry. And uh, I never looked back. Um, I still do some random, you know, uh, engineering stuff on the side if there's a unique problem that arises. But but yeah, it's a weird windy path. And it all comes back to the who you know, um, and the connections that you make, and you never know how they're going to reform or impact you later on in life. So before this interview today, I was at the National Cryptologic Museum, which is reopening after a refurb and and there they in the early days of american cryptography they they didn't test so much for what people knew at that time they tested for particular ways of thinking so i was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what are some of the similarities between the way that civil engineers think and and systems engineers and and people that are working in your field think like what are some of the things that carry over that mean that if you've got that if you think in that particular way, you'll be good in this field? Yeah, I think it's uh, it just comes down to problem solving and enjoying a good puzzle. Um, you know, and, and when you're when you're a civil engineer, you're looking for, hey, I need to, to get water from this dam to this hydroelectric facility, or I need to build this building and it needs to hold a thousand people. And so you're looking at, you know, you have constraints of time, resources, um, you know, budget, all of that stuff, right? And uh, so you're trying to solve that problem of how do I achieve this objective with the limited constraints that I have? And that's exactly what hacking is uh, in the same regard of, hey, I'm trying to, you know, compromise your active directory, compromise your oil refinery, break into this aircraft. um, And I have a very limited amount of information. How do I achieve this objective? So really, it's just problem solving and always loving a good puzzle. So and with this field that you're in and being a professional hacker, is there any uh, space for people like me and Aaron, people that are more humanities type folk, or, or is it still a preponderance of people that are like math, engineering, th- that type of mind? Uh, no, I, I mean, honestly, it, it's the full spectrum. The amount of people that we have on our team. So my background is civil engineering, right? Uh, if you were to take a survey of our team and say, what are your backgrounds? And we have several English majors. Uh, one of our best hackers used to be an RV salesman. We have a PhD in physics. So we all kind of meander and find our way into this career through, a, you know, everybody's story is completely unique, just like mine is. Um, but a lot of a lot of us come from the humanities uh, aspect of it. And um, really, the the aspect there that I that I think is most interesting is the abil- the ability to communicate to your clients um, who are running these systems. Because yes, I'm very technical, but if I can't explain something in such a way to somebody who is maybe not as technical as I am, then my complete job has failed and fallen apart if I can't communicate that accurately. And and so I always make the joke to my wife, who's an English major, that um, I never thought that I would be writing 
this like I went into engineering so I wouldn't have to write a word a day in my life. Uh, and now I read, you know, several thousand pages of reports as I QA them for our team. And then I have to write several hundred page ports, reports a week for our clients. So, um, yeah, the humanities, it, it's definitely one of those things, just the ability to communicate, the ability to pull from historical uh, you know, precedent and all that stuff. Pretty much the, w- the way that I see it for this industry is everybody has a unique skill set that is you know, wildly in need, even if you don't quite realize it yet. One of the things that I find really interesting about that industry is that a lot of the barriers to entry that exist for other fields are different in the in the cybersecurity realm. So, for example, if you want to be on the Supreme Court, you have to have been to law school. If you want to be in the Supreme Court, you don't have to have been to three or four law schools in the whole country. Uh, but it's pretty much a certainty that you're only going to get onto it unless you've been to one of those three or four law schools if we look at it historically. But it seems to me that the barriers to entry are are different in, this, in the field that you're in. And it also seems like I could be naive or, or idealistic, but it seems like it's more meritocratic in that sense because it's like you turn up in a kitchen as a chef People don't really give a monkeys where you went to chef school. They're going to they're going to judge you based on what you cook for them. So I wonder if you could just talk about that a little bit for us. I find that really interesting about the field that you're in. Yeah, I've, you you hit the nail on the head. It's complete meritocracy as far as if you are good at what you do and you and you can communicate it, you'll rise to the top. Um, and that's absolutely what I love about it. And it's it's kind of funny because. I have several of my friends who they see, Eric, you know what, you know, this is what you do. Wow. You know, you get to work from home. That's awesome. Um, you know, the pay is great. That's even better. And I'm like, you know what, you can do it too. And so I have a, a good friend of mine who was once a pastor now turned hacker. Um, and same thing. He, he's driven. He wants to do the work. He loves solving puzzles. And so he can apply all those communication skills and all of his other soft skills to the actual technical aspect of it. Um, my wife's college roommate is has a master's degree in biomedical engineering. And I was like, you know what? You could also do this too. And so sure enough, I keep trying to get, you know, all my friends and family. And it's kind of a joke now where it's like, oh, Eric's going to try and recruit you, huh? Um, but but that's exactly it. The barrier to entry, you don't need a four-year college degree to do this. Uh, you know, there. when I started, there was no such thing as a cybersecurity program. And so if we did hire anybody, the closest match uh, potentially would be a computer science degree. Um, but really what we care about most, at least on our team, is your ability to communicate and your ability to solve problems and your ability really just to think on your feet. Um, and, and those are, you know, it's harder from one aspect because you can't teach it. You can't just decide, I want to do this and be incredibly successful at it. You might have a four-year college degree in computer science. Heck, you might even be a PhD in computer science, but if you aren't going to be able to work a problem, think on your feet and communicate properly, um, it doesn't really matter what your credentials are. But you, you can't teach it. A lot of this is is something that you have to, you know, innately have as a part of your personality. So from one end of the spectrum, it's awesome because somebody who could be good at it in, you know, a year, you could show them everything that they need to know and they'll be off to the races. But on the other aspect of it, there's some things you just can't teach, um, you know, just like any other profession or any, any other field. Uh, and so in that regard, I absolutely love it because if somebody shows a proclivity to it, if somebody, if somebody shows that, Hey, they're willing to invest the time to learn a new skill. Um, you know, the, the sky is the limit. We only need more, more adversarial testers. We only need more computer science, uh, folks, um, from, from all walks of life. Right. So, so yeah. And just thinking about this historically, when you see things like this in the past, quite often there's there's then a movement towards professionalization and certification and codification and and then those barriers get reestablished where if you want to get into field x you have to have ticked all of these boxes do you see that in tech or do you ever think that that could really take off or do you just think that it wouldn't really work for this particular field yeah, you definitely see it now. Um, so you see now that now there are degree programs or certification, certification bodies, um, you know, all these different things to, like you say, try and make it more professional, try and put a suit and tie on a hacker, right? I think to a degree, yeah, that they will, you know, shut out potentially some, mostly because if you're trying to hire for, you know, if you have a job opening for, you know, hacker for hire, and you see that you have a hundred and, you know, a hundred potential employees and 50 of them have a four-year degree in computer science or, you know, security. If you're trying to just find a way to filter that down, you might just filter by that 
And you might lose a bunch of great candidates, but if you're a human and you're trying to make sense of how do I, you know, stack this, you know, how do I sort and filter these this stack of resumes in front of me? That might be a way that there be that there could be some gatekeeping. But I, I even still feel like with that, that there are ways to break into the industry, even if you don't have that four year degree, even if you don't have that going forward. Just because, like I said, it's or you know, like you said, it's it's a meritocracy, and and if you have skills, if you have ability, you will eventually find your way to a place that's going to appreciate and want and need those skills. Hmm. And when did you first realize that you had the chops to do this or not just the chops? Uh, I don't want to embarrass you, but you've, you know, you, <laughs> you went on to become and still are a very successful hacker. Like when did you realize that, wow, this is, this is somewhere where I can excel as opposed to just, yeah, I guess I'll be able to keep a roof over my head and, you know, stay out of jail and stuff like that. Yeah. When did you, when did it dawn on you that you, you know, this is somewhere where you could distinguish yourself? Uh, you know, I don't think it has yet. Uh, have you ever heard of <laughs> okay. Have you ever heard That's of good. imposter syndrome? <laughs> yeah, I've got uh, it. <laughs> every everybody in this field, uh, I shouldn't say I shouldn't speak for everybody, but I I would say if you surveyed this field, everybody feels like I feel like they're they're an imposter to a degree. And and for those in your audience listening, imposter syndrome is where uh, you you feel as if like, man, is somebody going to figure out that I don't know what I'm doing? Um, mm-hmm. There was one time my wife, uh, you know, she walks in my office. Um, and she's like, oh, are you just Googling how to do something for your job? And I'm like, absolutely. And she's like, what if your coworkers, you know, found out or, you know, like, like, you know, would that be kind of funny? I'm like, oh no, we all like, we're all Googling all the questions. Nobody can know it all. Um, and so really to answer your question, like I, like some people might look at me and be like, wow, Eric is a great hacker. He compromises and breaks in all these large companies. And then I have the people that I look up to. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like you could never call me a hacker compared to, you know, these individuals that I've met and these individuals that I know, like they're the real deal. I'm just an imposter here. So I really don't think it's quite hit. I mean, it does, it does pay the bills. Don't get me wrong. Um, and I don't think I'm going anywhere anytime soon, but, uh, you know, you're, you're, what's the saying? If you're the smartest one in the room, you're in the wrong room. And I, I don't think I've ever been in a room where I've been the smartest person. So, um, so yeah, uh, hopefully that answers that question. But I really just, yeah, every day feels like, like uh, I'm an imposter to a degree. And in this field as well, how much of it depends on current knowledge and how much of it just depends on this way of thinking and this skill set. So, for example, if you say you went into a, God forbid, say that a hack, let's not say you, let's say a hacker went into a coma for 10 years and then woke up, it's different technology, different problems, but a lot of the underlying fundamentals are the same. How difficult would it be to get back up to speed? Is that is that like you need to start all over again or is it just okay, you know how to think the right way. Now it's just a case of it's slightly different technology or slightly different code. I think you could take any person who is adept at solving challenges with constraints and they could get up to speed in this job in in a year, be able to talk the talk, walk the walk, and in two years, be able to hold the conversation in a room of professionals and nobody would knew that you never touched a keyboard a day in your life. So realistically, um, my view anyways, is that it is not about the tools. It's not about, you know, how the systems interact and operate. It just comes down to being able to, you know, the think on your feet. It comes down to being able to work through a problem with those constraints and anybody with that mindset, I think that they could go into a coma for a hundred years, wake up and, and still have that same of like, okay, I may not know anything. I may take some time to get up to speed, but it would not be like the nail in the coffin of like, oh, I waited too long. Like this has all gotten away from me because technology changes so rapidly that I'll, I'll go on vacation. I went on paternity leave um, last year. And so, you know, I'm not hands on keyboard for like three months as, you know, taking care of kids and um, taking care of the family. And then I get back to it. I'm like, whoa, look at all these new attacks. This is really cool. Uh, you know, look, look at all these things that are now available and look at all these things that previously, you know, we had no capability uh, to test. And now, you know, oh, wow, we bypass full disk encryption on the laptop. That's incredible. So it really, I think it is just if you're a problem solver, you can do this job. No problem. Doesn't matter when you decide to pick it up. And full disclosure for our audiences, Eric was talking there, uh, both Aaron and I were on Craigslist looking for apartments in California because 
I think we're both going to have a career change. Coming up <laughs> Please <quite> do. <laughs> and I, I don't live in the, the cool part of California. I live in a place called Fresno, which is the agricultural, like, you know, capital of the world. Heartland. So, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, I see way more cows than I do waves. <laughs> it's grapes of wrath country, right? Not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so th- th- this is really, really fascinating. Just to take a step back, Eric, tell us a little bit more about Secure Works, like like the company that you work for, and tell us what you do there. So we know you're a professional hacker, but help us understand the connection between you and Secure Works. What does your company do? Yeah, absolutely. So gosh, that is, I feel like that's a loaded question, right? Like our, I'm sure all of our uh, marketing team and sales team are looking at me like, come on, say the right things, Eric. Um, <laughs> but but essentially, Securex is a security company. And we have a bunch of different departments within our company that all, you know, take care of one aspect of security. So I work on what's called our SWAG team or SecureWorks Adversary Group. That's our acronym is SWAG, which is kind of cool. Um, and basically, we're the adversarial team. Clients come to us and say, please try and break into us. Tell us how you broke into us. And so we can patch it before a nation state, you know, or another threat actor is able to break into them. And so that's why it's the coolest job in the entire world from my perspective, because on any given day, I'm committing several thousand felonies if I didn't have permission to do what I'm doing. Um, Today, I'm up to over 100,000 felonies if you were to look at what I was able to do and the amount of users I was able to compromise. And so as far as like looking at the broader part of SecureWorks, I'm in the adversarial section where we attack our clients, you know, we for to try and make them more secure. But what's kind of neat is that we have a bunch of other, um, you know, divisions, I guess is the best way to put it within our company that do different aspects of security. So we have um, our incident response team. So basically, if, if your company were to get breached and find out, oh, no, uh, you know, you've been breached, you can call us, our guys will parachute in and basically say, hey, we're going to evict the threat actor, find out how they got in, patch the hole and, and make it so that your company can function again, right? If there's ransomware, how do we recover from backups? Is there, you know, potentially recovery keys somewhere? So that's incident response. So I break in, incident response responds when somebody like like me, that's not friendly breaks in. And then we also have our CTU team, our counter threat unit. Counter threat unit, they're responsible for seeing what does the adversarial landscape look like? What are nation states doing? What tools and techniques are being used by other threat actors that aren't friendly, you know, out in the wild? And then can we take what we've learned from there and apply it to our defensive products so that we're able to, to make sure that an incident never happens because we catch it before it does, right? So you can you can think of them as like, you know, the researchers in the field sampling all the things that are bad, taking it back home and uh, and writing, um, you know, different definitions to be able to catch any of that malware going forward. Or, you know, it doesn't have to be malware. It could be uh, more often than not how threat actors operate and, you know, their, their operating principles. And then we have our, our flagship product, which is Tejas. Tejas is like, um, it's an XDR platform. XDR is a fancy, basically, way of saying it is your enterprise way to monitor how threat actors are, you know, potentially trying to, to pivot into your network, how they're trying to access your network. And, you know, what does that look like? And can they catch that threat actor before, um, you know, before they're able to do anything? So it's kind of a fun cat and mouse game that we, you know, all those different divisions play against one another because, Incident response is like, oh, man, like, how could we find out, you know, what you're doing in your network? And, you know, there's always a cat and mouse game that goes uh, with Tate with our Tate's platform of, hey, can we bypass our own security product? Right. And so it's a it's a fun game to go back and forth and like, okay, you know, we bypass it here, then they patch it and then they can detect it. And, you know, just going back and forth. Um, but really, it makes everybody sharper on our team. And same thing with Counter Threat Unit. We're pulling in stuff that's being used in the wild. Um, so we can see, hey, what is, you know, what are threat actors in nation states and other, um, you know, adversarial groups? What are they doing? What do we see? So that's in a very, like, that. that is a, a, a very quick and concise, you know, summary of what we do. But it's really fun because you get it from all different angles. You get to see uh, what's happening in, in the basically cyberspace on the Internet. Wow. And how do you spell that, Tejas? Uh, t- I should know this. T-A-E-G-I-S. So this is like a model for just protecting a network? Oh, just correct? protecting a network. It's protecting oh, your... Sorry, your... not just protecting a network. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah. so so it's. Uh, I did spell that right. I had to look it up just to make sure. Yeah, so, it's, so it essentially goes, you know, you... It looks at 
your NIST, your network holistically and basically says, you know, not just, hey, what is happening to the server? It looks at your network holistically and says, you know, do we notice weird patterns? Do we see um, machines that have maybe not connected to other machines? Do we see authentication attempts that shouldn't be from certain hosts? It does a wide range of different things to look, not just that one single endpoint device. Now, hey, was this one computer compromised? But evidence of compromise throughout your entire network. Um, because oftentimes, if I'm going to break into, like, to get a little bit technical, if I'm going to break into your network, I typically don't like to use malware. I typically don't like to use, um, you know, some some tool that's going to get captured. What I typically do is find a way to gain credentials, you know, someone's username and password, and then I use their user account to basically do everything throughout their um, throughout their network. So there would be no malware to find because I'm using their network and their accounts as they should be used and, and finding vulnerabilities and weaknesses in their permission authentication schemes that, you know, is basically undetectable because I'm not using malware. And so there's a lot of pattern matching, a lot of, a lot of, you know, really technical stuff on their side of the house, um, you know, to, to prevent and discover things that are anomalies, so to say. Okay. When you say a security company, you mean cybersecurity? Cybersecurity company. Is that company. correct? Yeah. Although we do do, so as part of our adversarial testing, we also do physical security as well. So I've, you know, done the whole secret agent break in, clone badges, you know, go in at night, pick the lock and all that stuff as well. Oh, you have? Wow. Okay. Yeah. One of the things that I was, that, that I'm interested in is, you know, with this field, you know, like SpyCast is on the CyberWire network now. And we've tradi- we've done traditional intelligence espionage, and, and people kind of get that more or less. Okay, that's over here, and then they sort of get cyber. They're like, okay, that's computers. That's over there. I'm I'm increasingly interested in the places where they overlap, and it, it it seems that you know a lot of people are like, okay, well, the NSA like that's an area where you know both of them overlap, and other than that, it gets a bit it gets a bit fuzzy, and I'm not sure about it, but. You know, when you hear the term infosec, like information security, I mean, that's what a lot of what intelligence agencies do. Or when you were speaking about like breaking in without using malware, it's like intelligence agencies as well. They, I mean, sure, you can do some kind of brute force attack and get information. But if you scream out that you've just done something then they're going to go away and change all their codes and and do a whole bunch of countermeasures to try to protect themselves against what you've just committed against them so i don't want to say that both of them collapse into one another but it just seems really interesting to me all of the places that they overlap and i don't know if i've ever read a book or something that adequately explains that overlap but what do you have any thoughts about that yeah so Infosec, like I think all the like the industry terminology is always, always kind of funny because you say, oh, I'm an infosec and everybody's like, I don't know what that means. And it's like, that's really fair. And so when you think about it, you know, you, you expand it out, information security. And so a lot of people are like, oh, so you safeguard, you know, the typical things, right? Your your health data, your uh, financial data, your, you know, all these different things that you think of when you think of like, oh, my online accounts is what is being safeguarded. Well, it's interesting when you think about it, you know, so you mentioned, you know, ways that they overlap. Really, it's just information. You know, if you're if you're a spy agency, if you're a nation state, and you're trying to discern information, there's a lot of a lot of guesswork, a lot of educated guesswork that goes into that. And so, an example that I always kind of like to think about uh, realistically, if you look at say the United States political landscape, totally not a hot button issue. If you are a foreign you know nation and you're trying to understand, hey, what you know, what are the political parties you know angling to do? What's going on here? Well, think if they were able to break into say the you know, manufacturer of, of like flags, right. Of little American flags that would get waved around at campaign rallies. Well, if you knew how many orders of each of those flags were going to respective, you know, different political campaigns and parties and all that stuff. Well, now you've built up just with that information of orders of flags. If you're able to compromise a small manufacturing place, now, you know, all the ordering, all the processing information of how that goes, typically logistics of who, how, where, and why those flags are going to be in that position. You typically know how many are in the Worcester, how many expe- people they're uh, expecting at a campaign rally, right? And so there's, it's, it's one of those things that it's information security because you don't necessarily know how the information is going to be used. You know, you might have a threat actor that breaks in trying to that same flag company, trying just to steal, you know, email addresses so that they can spend, send out, you know, phishing emails just willy-nilly. 
Or you might have a nation state trying to compromise that same flag factory for the purpose of trying to divine what does the political landscape look like in the United States for the upcoming midterms. There's a lot of there's a lot of hypotheticals, and then there's a lot of like, oh, you know, where things actually overlap, like you said, with NSA and other intelligence agencies. And even for it seems to me that even for like for someone like you that's in the private sector, this is still part of your world because the companies and so forth that you're doing this penetration testing for, this hacking for, it seems to me that quite a few of them will be trying to protect themselves against nation state actors like Russia and China and hacker groups that are affiliated with intelligence agencies from those countries. So, uh, th- I mean, that's quite interesting as well. It seems to me that whether, you know, you don't, you don't have a choice in the matter almost because because nation states have a large amount of resources, they can put manpower to a problem for decades and decades, theoretically, or or even longer. Uh, so people like you are up against this these foreign intelligence agencies. It's it's not like a matter of choice. It's just it just is. That, that's quite interesting to me. Yeah, and that's I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Is the way that I always like to think about it is that if I if I said, hey, Andrew, you know what? I'm going to send 12 special force, you know, 12 special force operators to come break into your house. And if I said that and then, you know, it got plastered all over the news. Oh, my gosh. Can you believe Andrew? He got compromised because 12 Navy SEALs kicked in his door. Everybody would be like, well, yeah, it's a normal person against 12 well-trained Navy SEALs. Of course that's going to happen. What do you expect? But, but realistically, <laughs> in the cyber domain, it's even worse because you have nation states that are funded with millions and billions of dollars potentially targeting you know, a small company, a medium-sized company, even a large company. Um, even if you look at a large company and you said, hey, 12 Navy SEALs, kick your, door, your way in the door, you know, a, a lot, you know, the news, the, you know, the media apparatus would be a lot more friendly saying, oh, well, yeah, no one would, no one would expect that they should be able to withstand an attack against a nation state. But that's what we're asking everyone to do. I mean, that's what we're asking you and I to do every time we're trying to protect our email, every time we're trying to use encryption for anything, login passwords to Facebook, Instagram, all your social media accounts. All of these things have to be able to defend themselves against you know, the latest and greatest technology threat actors and, you know, the equivalent of the digital Navy SEALs. And, and that, that's exactly it, is that it's, is that we are having to, you know, do this not by choice, but because this, this is the state of the world. And not only, you know, to, to break down the analogy even more of like 12 Navy SEALs kicking in your door, they can do that from their respective country. So they don't even have to like get out of bed, you know, to potentially perform that attack. Whereas if they were, you know, physical, actual operatives, they would have to. Um, and so that's that's just the reality of where we live is that, um, you know, all of this information is constantly being attacked 24 hours a day, seven days a week from, you know, uh, like hacking groups that are built out of teenagers, right? right? The most recent um, hacks, I think, of, of Uber was tied to Lazarus Group, which is a bunch of teenagers, right? Um, I could be totally wrong on that. I'm pretty sure. I think that's right. But the analogy stands up. It could be anybody. It could be nation state. It could be a bunch of teenagers, um, across across the world, so it is. It's one of those things that when you when you frame it in that mind, you're like, yeah, that's a really hard problem because turns out countries have a lot of resources that if they want to break in somewhere, they can apply hundreds of people potentially to focus on one problem. You know, to to put in all that brain power in it and trying to break in. I, I like that analogy, the Navy SEALs. I, I was also just thinking that the Navy SEALs can't break your door down while eating a bag of Cheetos, but a hacker uh, overseas can, right? Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's funny. There's been several times where it's like, oh, I'm making dinner or, you know, like, got to watch the kids right now, um, you know, before if they woke up from their nap early. So it's like, wow, I'm breaking into a Fortune 500 company while like hanging out with my four-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and this is the this is where this term APT comes from, right? Advanced persistent threats. That's a nation state that can just throw relatively infinite amounts of money and time at a problem. Yeah, and it, it could be a nation state. It could be combinations of nation states. It could be really well resourced, you know, threat actors. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a nation state, but yeah, advanced persistent threat. And they're typically named. Um, so if 
uh, you know, a lot of different threat actors. They have, you know, similar processes. They have similar techniques, similar tools. And so you can kind of aggregate those. Like what, what our CTU team would do is they basically say, okay, there's this hacker group that we don't know anything um, or, you know, we don't necessarily know like, oh, this is who they are, but we can tell from their attack pattern and like what they're doing that this is probably a similar group and they might have some crossover, but not necessarily needs to be a nation state, but um, definitely well-resourced and definitely professionals in the field of what they're doing. Wow. And w- one of the one of the things that I wanted to ask as well was, can you break down this term kill chain for us? I've heard this like used quite a lot and I know that in the realm of cyber it's quite important and uh, for some of our listeners this will be you know something that trips off their tongue but for others they'll be what the heck are they talking about so what's the what's the kill chain yeah so I'll give you I'll give you a brief example with a story um, of, of a test that we recently did so kill chain in like a one sentence thing is basically how you're able to achieve your objective how you're able to compromise somebody from the beginning to the end so if you're reading a book it's just a quick story, a quick narrative of how were you able to do it? So for like one of our one of our tests, we're trying to break into this medical facility and we're trying to break into it from the public internet. So just like any any other internet user um, has the same level of access as we do. And they give us, hey, here's our here's our target computers to break into. We found, hey, there's a page publicly available that says, um, have you forgotten your password? Click here to reset it. You only need to answer some security questions. Uh, so we found a list of users on LinkedIn and we compared them to the social media profiles such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, all, all these publicly available social media things. And we found some of the questions were things you could probably look up on social media. Um, so one of them was like favorite superhero. Found the person's Facebook page instantly. Obviously, it's Batman. And so it went from there. And so we had one of their security security questions already. The next question was uh, their maternal mother's maiden name or maternal grandmother's maiden name. So something... Seems pretty abstract until you stumble upon an obituary that contains that same information. So now we're able to reset this user's password. We reset their password. We're able to log into their VPN, so the way that they remotely access their company. Um, And then from there, we're able to impersonate them on the network. We're then able to access a file share on their network. And now, now from the public internet, we're accessing a server within their internal corporate network. Turns out that file server had, you know, some vulnerabilities with it, and it was able to basically access a more secure server. Um, so we're able to go into from from one file server into a more secure server, which contained the entire company's uh, username and password database. And so I was then able to extract all the information sitting from the public internet. So that that's essentially what a kill chain is: all the different steps that you use to achieve that objective of whatever the client wants or however a company was compromised. So does that, does that make sense? Hopefully I explained that okay. I, I think so. So it's like like going over a bridge and then at each stage of the bridge, there's a, the potential to be stopped or the potential not to complete your journey and, and you have to keep completing every 50 meters to get to the end and the kill chain is just, if you can stop them over the length of the bridge, get into the end of the bridge, then... And uh, uh, th- does that make sense, or is yeah, that not? Yeah, yeah, no, and that, that's that's very similar. Of just you're trying to find a path to achieve your objective, and for us, the kill chain is how, all the different steps that you achieve that objective. And then what's nice is that when we generate a report for our clients, we basically say, here are like you know the ten or fifteen key steps. Had you stopped us at any point along the way in these steps, then you would have potentially stopped us from the compromise. And then. You know, so that's like a chain if you think about it, like a physical chain. But then it also can be more like a web from the standpoint of like there's more than one way to you know to potentially compromise. And so there's all the you know additional kill chains potentially and and how those stem and weave. Um, but yeah, that, that's the nail on the head is where can you get stopped along that path along that path of compromise. And h- help us understand a little bit more as well about hardening the attack surface. So that's one of the terms that. I've heard. How do you harden an attack surface? Break that down for our listeners. Yeah. So, um, say you're just a standard, a standard computer user, right? You, um, you have your just your standard laptop, and let's talk about like hardening your laptop, or you know, this sounds like a really oh, we got to harden, no secure, you know, batten down the hatches kind of thing. And really, um, it's it's not that dissimilar from just like if you're in standard, you know, com- large companies try to harden their systems just like you could harden your laptop. So, hey, maybe the password that you used to log into your laptop, maybe that's just, you know, a four-digit code. Well, if you're trying to harden it, make it harder for somebody to get in, 
instead of having a four digit code, maybe use a sentence that's like 15 characters long. So it's easy to type in your keyboard. That would be one way that then I couldn't just potentially guess what your password is, you know, if it's four zeros in a row. Um, other things that you might do is, hey, I'm not going to, um, you know, potentially connect to like public Wi-Fi. Or if I am, I'm going to use something like a VPN to protect my internet traffic as it leaves my computer. Other things that like like trying to harden yourself might be something physical. I'm not going to leave my laptop in my backpack in the back of my car when I go to the grocery store, right? So, um, so it doesn't have to just be in the in the you know the digital domain. Um, and there's a lot of things like that, like just enabling something like multi-factor authentication, which is like if you log into your bank, you're logging to something else where you get like a text message or you have to you know hit a hit a button on your phone. Just adding those simple things is is hardening you know your tax service, is limiting your tax service, so that um, if I'm trying to break into say your your Facebook, your Gmail, your Instagram, um, and there's a second factor authentication, uh, I would need to I would basically need to steal your phone in order to you know get that second factor of authentication. And same thing, if you're using a hard, unique password that I couldn't just guess, well, good luck then. There's this something else that I don't know. Um, so that that's really all that it is, is it's a really simple concept of just you're, you're limiting um, the way that somebody like me is going to be able to easily break into you and just creating more and more barriers of difficulty. Okay. So it's, it's almost like, it seems it's almost like defense in depth rather than one huge wall like in the Game of Thrones. It's just here's like two dozen walls where I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it really difficult for you to, to do this. And it's probably going to be easier for you just to go somewhere else and make your, make your life easier. And that's the, so there's, there's always an analogy that I like to, or, or it's, it's more of a joke, um, of your, your camping with your buddy, uh, you and your buddy at your campsite and a bear stumbles into your campsite and you start putting your shoes on and your buddy leans in and he says, there's no way you're going to outrun that bear. And he goes, I don't need to outrun that bear. I just need to outrun you. And that's ex and, and that's exactly what like it is. That one. <laughs> ha hackers, hackers are lazy. We're opportunistic, and um, you know we're not going to struggle and try and, and try and crack the hardest server if you know the next server over is going to be something that is old and outdated and easy to compromise. We're always going to go find the path of least resistance. And so, in that same case, if you are a hardened target, if you're a target that has multi-factor authentication, unique passwords for everything, and long passwords. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to go after you. I'm potentially going to try and find another way um, either into your system through somebody else, or I'm, you know, just going to leave you alone altogether. And so that, that's really all that it is, is just adding, you know, it's like layers of security, right? So um, there doesn't have to be, like you said, one big wall, but hey, little incremental steps that you could do just to make it my life harder as a hacker. Okay. And just before we move on from uh, this, these definitions which are really really helpful by the way thanks so much for doing this and indulging me uh zero days this is the last one help us understand what zero days are yeah so uh zero days the the quick definition of it is it's basically a vulnerability or an exploit in a system that nobody knows uh that that you know no company is aware of um and so the the reason where it gets the term zero days is uh it's days since it was discovered um, so say uh, a vulnerability is found in, in Windows and uh, it's been, you know, a certain number of days since it's been discovered. So it's been 10 days. It's been, you know, 11 days. It's been, you know, three months. So how many days passed since it's been discovered? Has it been out in the wild? And zero days are at zero because they are out in the wild and nobody knows about them potentially. And so the reason that zero days are are so, um, you know, I guess like mythical or, you know, um, you know, so scary is because, you could be, you know, using a fully patched iPhone and that fully patched iPhone completely up to date, all the security stuff, you know, technically as secure as an iPhone could be, if it has a zero day in it, that means that a threat actor or an attacker potentially has access to it, even though it's been completely patched, completely updated and has all the latest security definitions. And that's what makes it so scary is that you don't even know that you're vulnerable because uh, you don't even, you know, because nobody else in the world other than the attacker potentially knows that this vulnerability exists. Um, and so that, that's why it's called zero day because hasn't even you know, basically been released. Nobody's aware of it. And that's the reason that they're scary is because, again, you like Apple recently patched a couple of zero days where, hey, they found out iPhones are being actively exploited and against fully patched, updated, you know, devices. And so they had to release, you know, once they discovered it, then they released patches and, you know, all that stuff to, to update your phone, which is why you should always keep your devices up to date. But that being said, that that's basically the, the simple definition of it is just something that that is not known to the rest of the security community. 
And how do these things come to light? Like with zero days, is there uh, malicious actors out there that are just specifically hunting down zero days or is it someone stumbles across it that works for a company puts it on the, the the dark net and says you know i'm offering this for this amount of bitcoin or something send it to this address yeah help help, help the average person on the street understand how these things come to light um or or not come to light for everybody because the whole point is that you're, you get access to this before other people know about it so you can take advantage of it. So help us understand how these things like bubble up and come to the surface. Yeah, so there are, so there are dedicated researchers that they spend all of their time, you know, looking for very specific vulnerabilities into very specific systems. That's not everybody. That's not how all zero days are discovered. Um, but what's what's interesting is that uh, there's a term called bug bounties, where basically companies say, hey, if you find a zero day, if you find a vulnerability by chance or because you're a researcher in any of our systems, we'll pay you a certain amount of money per level of the vulnerability to report it to us and let us know. So I think, you know, Apple has some crazy like $2 million bug bounty so that if you did find a zero day in the most up-to-date, you know, iOS and you report it to them, you get, you know, several hundred thousand dollars for sure. And I think maybe up to a million is the most that's ever been paid out. Um, so companies will pay to say, hey, if you find it to us, report it to us and like all above board, all, you know, we'll send it to you. You're not a criminal. You are more than allowed to try and find this stuff. And if you report it to us and do responsible disclosure, you know, completely, you know, please, please let us know, you know, make the, you know, the world a more secure place. Sometimes you just stumble into them. So there's been several, you know, websites, applications that I've looked at. And, you know, you get into like a weird, a weird edge case where you're like, oh, if I just don't put a username in this field and hit submit, it logs me in as an administrator. Well, that's a vulnerability. And was I trying to do anything nefarious? No, not necessarily. It could have just been an accident. Um, but that's technically a zero day. So it's, you know, there's researchers, it spans the whole spectrum of researchers who are dedicated to like only looking at certain platforms for high paying bounties. Um, and then there are, uh, you know, just people that stumble across a vulnerability. And um, just because it's a zero day doesn't mean that it is, you know, you know, actually weaponized or anything. It might be like, oh, I noticed that there's a flaw in this application. So maybe the zero day doesn't actually get me any like really great access or really great um, ability to do something. But still, nobody knows about it. And if it helps you as a part of your kill chain, then yeah, it could be kind of a scary zero day. But not all zero days are like, and then we got access to all of his text messages and just from his phone number. Um, but but yeah, d d does that make sense as far as like the the ranges of, of what's out there? It, it does. Yeah, that's really helpful. And t tell me if I've understood this properly. So one of the ways that I have thought about this in the past is a zero day is like Buckingham Palace, where you can go around and make sure that every single window is closed, but if one window out of 15,000 is not closed and no one knows that it hasn't been closed, then the whole palace is potentially vulnerable if someone knows where that one window that hasn't been closed is. is that Would that be a good analogy? That's, that's pretty spot on as far as I always tell my clients, look, I have the easy job. I need to find one way in. You have the hard job. You have to, you know, basically make sure all of those windows are all completely closed. In the past, it used to be exactly like that of like, hey, you find one window open, game over, you've completely taken over the entire thing. Um, different applications, different websites, different, you know, physical devices like iPhones and Android phones. Um, they're starting to implement or not starting. They have implemented additional security layers and security features so that um, say you're to compromise an iOS app or an app on an uh, on an iPhone. Um, you know, there's things like the secure enclave to get really technical that keep, you know, things like keys and private data uh, secure on those devices. So, um, you know, for some networks, you know, there are some times where if you get a zero day on that network or if you're able to compromise that network, you have the keys to the kingdom and you can run around all of Buckingham Palace, you know, scream at the top of your lungs and you have, you know, you are good to go. Um, and then there are other, you know, in a large, a lot of time it's um, from larger companies that have, you know, different layers of, you know, of, of uh, security aspects in place that um, make it so that, hey, maybe you got in through the entryway, but you're never going to make it down the hallway into, you know, uh, you know, bedroom chambers or something like that. And in the context of Buckingham Palace, the kill chain would be everything that's trying to stop you getting into the Queen's, sorry, R.I.P., the King's bedroom. Yeah, the King's bedroom. Um, it would be 
Uh, it would be the fence, it would be the electronic security system, it would be the dogs, it would be the security team, it would be the windows, it would be the material of the windows, it would be the sensors in the hallways. All of those things are trying to stop you getting through to the end. Yeah, and, and so the kill chain in this perspective is all the different things that an attacker did. So, you know, did they, like you said, did they bypass the motion sensors? Did they jump the gate? All the different things that they were able to do that if if any one of them had worked properly and kept out the attacker, you know, that kill chain wouldn't exist. The kill chain is all the things that were breached along the way. And in the context of your job, you would try to get into Buckingham Palace. And then when you got in, you would say, here's how I got in and here's how you need to harden the attack surface. Yep, and that's exactly it. And it's funny because uh, you bring up the Buckingham Palace example, but the thing that I always tell our clients are, hey, look, I can steal user passwords all day. I can access files, shares all day. Tell me what your crown jewels are and what keeps you up at night. And so when you say Buckingham Palace, it's funny because I always tell our clients, tell me what your crown jewels are and that's what I'll go steal. And I'll tell you exactly how I stole them um, so that you can, you know, block every aspect of that kill chain so that if somebody like me were to come back, all those things have been patched, blocked, updated, um, or remediated in some way. It would be funny if the Royal Palace reached out to you and said, and you said, you know, what's your, what's your crown jewels? Um, the crown <laughs> uh, jewels. The actual crown jewels, Eric. <laughs> all right. Challenge accepted. Let's go. Thanks for listening to this episode of SpyCast. Go to our webpage where you can find links to further resources, detailed show notes, and full transcripts. We have over 500 episodes in our back catalogue for you to explore. Please follow the show on Twitter at INTLSpyCast and share your favourite quotes and insights or start a conversation. If you have any additional feedback, please email us at spycast at spymuseum.org. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Hammond, and you can connect with me on LinkedIn or follow me on Twitter at Spy Historian. This show is brought to you from the home of the world's preeminent collection of intelligence and espionage-related artefacts, the International Spy Museum. The Spycast team includes Mike Mincy and Memphis Vaughn III. See you for next week's show.